Morning, friends. Morning. I'm Black Dragon. Welcome to Black Dragon Biker TV. We got an interesting one today. Pretty interesting one today. We're going to jump right into it. We uh, have the government getting ready to take a clubhouse and up in Canada. And it's not the first time they've done it. And this is a this is a convoluted web. This case has been hanging around since 2016, and it's based on a murder. So we're going to tell you the story, and um, we'll be doing that right after this brief introduction. So stand by, and we'll be right back. I'm Black Dragon, and welcome to Black Dragon Biker News Network, part of the Biker News Association. Uh, and I'd just like to thank you all for tuning in from wherever it is in the world that you happen to be. Um, if you like this kind of, uh, these kinds of stories, uh, motorcycle club protocol, that sort of thing, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. We'd absolutely appreciate that. Share means like actually share it with somebody. And subscribe means hit that subscription button and the notification bell so that you can be notified whenever we do content. Absolutely, absolutely appreciate that. I want to say thank you to all the new subscribers. We've been getting lots of new subscribers here lately. And uh, I just want to thank you all. So getting right into this story, let me see if I can get my... Can you guys bring that screen up for me? I uh, absolutely appreciate it. So... Uh, this whole story starts off a long time ago when a young man got killed, I believe, back in 2016. And that has led us to where we are today. Um, and make sure to go over to Black Dragon Biker News, uh, bikerliberty.com to get all of your daily stories. But anyway, uh, British Columbia wants to seize, as in take, uh, a clubhouse where a man was murdered. Actually, where this young man was murdered, Mr. John Dylan Brown. He was murdered there in 2016, uh, I believe, or is it? Uh, yeah, something like that. We'll, we'll get into it. I'll be able to tell you guys exactly. So this is the man that was accused of uh, killing him and actually was found guilty of it. So the director of civil forfeiture has filed a lawsuit seeking to seize the Devil's Army Clubhouse in Campbell River. So they have some guy who's named, who's, uh, who is the director of civil forfeiture. We call it civil asset forfeiture here in the United States. And he's filed a claim to take the clubhouse of this motorcycle club. The British Columbia government wants convicted killer and Hell's Angels associate Richard Alexander, to hand over the Campbell River Clubhouse where he killed a man in 2016. On Wednesday, the director of civil forfeiture filed a statement of claim against Alexander asking for a court order to seize the Devil's Army Clubhouse on Peterson Road in the island community. Uh, Alexander was convicted of first-degree murder earlier this year for killing mixed martial arts fighter Dylan Brown inside the clubhouse in March 2016, then leaving his body in the trunk of a car near Sayward. The jury heard Alexander shot Brown, 30 years old, because he su uh, had sued a Campbell River nightclub. So let's go quickly over here to that story. And I don't know if you guys remember, but we did that story. And it was this young man right here who got into a fight. Um, 
in in a bar. So his name was John Dylan Brown, 30 years old. He was found dead inside his car near the west side of a bridge to uh, say we're at about 75 kilometers north or kilometers north of Campbell River on March 12, 2016. So the, the former president of the Devil's Army Motorcycle Club has been convicted of that March 2016 murder of Dylan Brown. He was a competitive mixed martial arts fighter. On March 15th, a B.C. British Columbia Supreme Court jury found Richard Ricky Alexander guilty on the first degree murder of Brown. Now, this guilty, this guilty plea or the, the finding of guilty is really kind of interesting because a lot of stuff went on to get to this guilty verdict. Um, as you will see, um, he was uh, shot in the head at the Devil's Army Clubhouse in Campbell River on March 11, 2016, with eight sheriffs standing by Alexander, who was then 68, was placed in handcuffs and led from the courtroom to begin serving the mandatory sentence of life in prison with no possibility of parole for 25 years. A sentencing hearing was going to be held that Thursday afternoon. Nicole Herman Brown's uh, former partner and mother of his two children uh, this is Brown's former, uh, Nicole, Nicole Herman, which was Dylan Brown's uh, former partner and mother of his two children, cried with relief as the verdict was read. On the other side of the courtroom, members of Alexander's family appeared surprised. Two women put their heads in their hands and cried. The 11-member jury, which had been sitting since February 14th, began deliberations around 8 p.m. on Monday. On Wednesday afternoon, they returned to the court to tell the judge they were deadlocked. And here's where it kind of gets interesting, uh, because they couldn't, they couldn't come up with a, guilt, uh, a guilty verdict initially. After exhaustive discussion and numerous votes, we as a jury have failed to reach a unanimous verdict. We now ask your advice on how to proceed, said the note handed to the judge, Jeff Gall. Uh, he urged them to... Give it one more try. At 9 p.m. on Wednesday, the jury asked to sit for another hour. At 10.15 p.m., they announced they had reached a unanimous verdict. Identity was the key issue during the trial. The verdict means the Crown, the government, proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Alexander was the person who killed Brown and that the murder was planned and deliberate. The defense had accused another full-patch member of the Devil's Army, now a protected Crown witness. So the devil's army uh, or, or the defense said that, no, it's this guy that is your, your, your witness, your snitch, your, your confident, your informant. This guy is the guy who actually committed the murder. And although the public gallery was almost empty during the first week of the murder trial, interest grew. Alexander's supporters and family members, including his son and his sister, attended the uh, court proceedings in greater numbers earlier this week or that week, an overflow courtroom was open to allow people to watch the proceedings. So it started off pretty tame. Hardly nobody was there. And then it got pretty big. The trial had been under heavy scrutiny. People entering the courtroom were required to pass through metal detectors. You know, they always do that. They always go, you know, way overboard when it's a biker club, especially an outlaw biker club or a 1% biker club. Uh, so they had to go through metal detectors and have their belongings searched like they were criminals. Half of the third floor was blocked off when protected witnesses testified. You know, the guy that was the CI, the, the informant, the undercover dude, the snitch guy. They had the whole floor blocked off when he, uh, when he would testify. Undercover officers mixed with members of the public. So <laughs> they had undercovers out there in the uh, gallery and stuff. So you didn't know who you were sitting next to. So they were just ready for you to start something so that... Uh, one of them could grab your butt and get you up out of there. It was crazy. The defense didn't call any witnesses. Uh, the crown um, theory, the theory for the crown, was um, that Alexander killed Brown, a 30-year-old father and construction worker and a mixed martial artist, to put an end to a lawsuit that he would make, um, that he would make hell, uh, the Hells Angels in their puppet club so they were calling the, the Devil's Army the Hells Angels Puppet Club. That's what they called them in court. Uh, maybe it was a support club or something, but they called it a puppet club. And uh, this was a lawsuit that he had made against them. 
and, and they felt like that lawsuit would make them look bad. Brown had been in a fight with three to five of the bikers from both the Hells Angels and the um, Devil's Army. At uh, there, So there's about three to five of them at the Campbell River nightclub, the Voodoo Lounge in November 2015. And as we reported back then, it said that he held his own against the group of bikers, that they didn't really whoop him, but he was injured and ended up in the hospital. He decided to sue the nightclub to pay for dental bills and uh, lost wages because uh, the bouncers did not stop the fight or come to his assistance. You know, they weren't messing with them, them bikers, so he sued them. And during that, he asked for and received a video of the fight that was captured on the nightclub surveillance system. Brown showed the video to several people and tried to recruit witnesses for his lawsuit. Some of his friends wanted nothing to do with the lawsuit when they found out it involved the Hells Angels. So he was pretty much out there on his own. Phone records reveal that Alexander phoned Brown on January 30th, 2016, presuma, presuma, presumably, if I could speak today, presumably to negotiate the lawsuit. Now, the Crown believed Alexander was worried criminal charges against the bikers might arise out of that civil suit. The evidence presented at the trial revealed there were more phone calls and text messages between the two men. The Crown believed Alexander began stringing Brown along, promising him a payout of $10,000 for his injuries if he dropped the lawsuit. That was just to get him over to the clubhouse. So he asked Brown to meet him to the, uh, at the clubhouse in the, on the afternoon of March 11th. Witness X, the guy that won't be named, the guy that, that got the good cushy deal, Witness X, then a full patch member of the Devil's Army, testified against his brothers that before Brown arrived, Alexander asked him to help get some, someone to the car. X said he thought that meant someone was coming to the clubhouse for drugs. X also testified that when Brown arrived, Alexander told him to close the clubhouse gate. That was fishy. X went back inside the clubhouse and turned on the TV. Then he went to the beer cooler to grab something to drink, but on his way, alas, he caught sight of something out of the corner of his eye, just behind the couch. He turned his head and realized it was a person. He thought the man had been punched out, but when he reached toward him, he smelled gunpowder. X realized Brown had been killed. Alexander has admitted that he drove Brown's car with Brown's body in the trunk to Sayward, and abandoned abandon the car near the cable bridge on Sayward Road. The jury was able to watch videos of Alexander walking away from the bridge toward the Sayward Junction, then walking south on the Island Highway on the day of the murder. But he said he didn't commit the murder. The Crown believed that when Brown entered the clubhouse, Alexander was waiting with a loaded firearm. Brown's body was discovered the next day. Now, Alexander was arrested in 2018. Two years later, a mistrial was declared at his first trial in April 2021 during X's testimony. Now, this is some more fishy stuff. The reasons for the mistrial during X's testimony are protected by a publication ban. Fishy, fishy, fishy. What, what, what's going on that the public can't know? Wait, well, you had a witness in there. Something happened during his testimony. Hmm, something untoward, something. And a mistrial was declared, and everybody was put under a gag order. Publication ban, excuse me. Publication ban. And so that was, um, that was interesting. That was kind of crazy. So as you can see, you can imagine that this guy feels like he's got a pretty good chance for a, um, an appeal, a lot of stuff going on. You know what I mean? A lot of itchy, witchy, itchy, itchy kind of way BS going on. So it's interesting kind of like how the government moves. Check this stuff out. So as we said, Alexander was convicted of that first degree murder and he has to do 25 years. He's got to do 25 years before he could even get parole 
And uh, like we said, the, the crown of the theory that he was trying, he, he killed the, the boy to uh, stop him from, the young man, to stop him from uh, testifying against him. But Alexander has appealed his conviction. And we can see why. There's a lot of things going on. He maybe feels like he's got a decent appeal. So while he's waiting for that to happen, in comes the long arm of the civil asset forfeiture director. Yeah. Uh, not so fast there, because when you if you win that appeal, you ain't gonna have no place to come back to. Because he filed a lawsuit alleging that the Devil's Army is a puppet or support club. Okay, so that's what they call support clubs up there in Canada. They call them puppet clubs. So they said the Devil's Army is a puppet or a support club of the older Hells Angels and that both are criminal organizations. Alexander is a founding full patch member and president of the Devil's Army Motorcycle Club. The statement uh, of claim says, so he was the founder and the president of this club. At all material times, uh, Alexander has been a member of an organization comprised of... Okay, so here, here are those elements. He's been a member uh, and a founder of an organization comprised of more than three persons. That's, that's predicate one. Inside or outside Canada, two, which has as one of its main purposes or main activities the facilitation or commission of one or more serious offenses. Three, that makes you a gang in most places. In addition to murder, Alexander has a criminal record, uh, the complaint goes on to say, that includes convictions for possession for the purpose of trafficking, possession of a prohibited firearm and ammunition. Because, you know, they can't have all that up there in Canada, uh, which I don't know why. I mean, I, they're, they're, they're on a piece of America, you, you know, it's all the same continent, you would think that, but it's not, it's not the case. And so uh, he had a prohibited firearm and ammunition, the director said. How do, you know, how does the civil asset forfeiture guy uh, get to weigh on, weigh in on your criminal activities? That's interesting. Uh, ain't you a civil person? But he gets to add all this into the into the complaint that uh, possession of the firearm and ammunition and, and a criminal record for convictions of possession for trafficking and all kinds of stuff. Alexander, who lives uh, in Maple Ridge, bought the clubhouse property for in 2015 for $150,000. It is currently assessed at half a million dollars. Man. I wonder, I wonder if the Dragon's Lair here will ever be worth half a million dollars. Huh. I'm in the wrong business. I wonder if the one day you guys come on over to the old Dragon's Lair and I'd be like, hey, bro, don't sit your ass on my half a million dollar seats over there. Stand up at the bar, man. Don't, don't, even, don't even play with me like that. Don't play. But at this point, uh, the Dragon's Lair is worth nowhere near that, but that was a, quite a come up. He uh, got that property for one fifty. Currently, it's worth five hundred sixty nine thousand uh, dollars. For my viewing, uh, for my viewing listeners, uh, watchers, uh, this is the Devil's Army uh, Campbell River back three piece back patch. And for my listening audience, uh, it, it, it looks pretty cool. So the director said the clubhouse was not occupied as a permanent residence, but was available for use and temporary occupation to members of the Devil's Army and the Hells Angels. The property has been customized. Now, this is, listen, this is the ugly parts that they be doing. You got this right here. Oh, my God. Like. I, I don't I don't know if they've used this in America before, but now they're looking at how you how you conduct your property. And this is part of the suit. They say the property 
has been customized to impede access by law enforcement and rival groups, the lawsuit says. Now, let me understand this. Here in the great old U.S. of A., you can put heavy doors on your thing and you can set your house up so that it, so that, you know, burglars and stuff can't kick the doors in. You can put bars on your, this is normal stuff. Dude, you live in a rough neighborhood around here. You might put bars on your windows. You know, you might have some bars up on your windows so people can't get in. Is that impeding law enforcement and rival biker gangs? Whew. Holy moly. They put that in the lawsuit. It, it, no, we're just, those are security windows and security doors. Nope. They're imposition windows that impede law enforcement. Well, here in the United States, you know, you got to have a warrant, a search warrant. You, what, you know, just get to kick in doors and stuff around here. This is not, if you knock real nice, we'll let you in. But this is part of the, the lawsuit. The property has been customized. Meaning you guys did some more to it than was already there. And that more to it was specifically to impede access by law enforcement and rival groups, the suit says. On March 11, 2016, R. Alexander used the property, furthermore, to commit a murder. These are the reasons we need to take it. it it's, it's been used for a bunch of stuff, a commit a murder, drugs and stuff. People from the Hells Angels and the Devil's Army can actually temporarily stay there. Uh, I always thought of that as, um, you know, how they turn everything. Like, yeah, you can stay in the clubhouse overnight. We would rather have you stay in the clubhouse than, than drink and ride. So, yeah, you can temporarily stay in the clubhouse. Your girl puts you out. Come hang out at the clubhouse for a few weeks, a month or so. Whatever you need to do. That's what the clubhouse is for. That's what the Dragon's Lair is for. That's what the Campbell River, River property is for. Unless it gets turned around by a crafty, well-trained lawyer who says, oh, no, the property has been customized to impede access by law enforcement and rival groups, the suit says. Ouch! Therefore, for all of these reasons, not occupied by a permanent residence, but available for temporary occupation by members of the Hells Angels and the Devil's Army, customized to impede access to law enforcement, used to commit a murder, used to sell drugs out of, and so forth and so on. For those reasons, this property, hold on, I need the appropriate, need the appropriate voice here. This property has been customized and other things, and therefore, this property should be forfeited Mm -hmm. And the proceeds, proceeds, the, the money, the proceeds of an instrument of unlawful activity. Can I get an amen? And that's what they're going to do. That's what they're going to do. They're going to, they're, they've said in this, in, this, in this lawsuit, the property should be forfeited as, as the proceeds of and an instrument of unlawful activity. The government move to seize the biker clubhouse is the fourth so far in the Providence. You see, they, they've been doing this for a minute. You guys remember this story? BC moves to seize the Hells Angels clubhouses in Nanaimo. I think these clubhouses were worth like $2 million. You remember this? Let's, let's play this. 
Three Hells Angels clubhouses have been seized in Nanaimo, Vancouver and Kelowna. The BC Civil Forfeiture Office moved on the seizure today. Anti-gang combined forces went along with local police keeping peace while the agency took control of the properties. In February, BC's highest court ruled the province could seize the clubhouses because the bikers would likely keep using the properties to plan or commit illegal activities. The panel says the clubhouses give a a safe space for the planning and commission of crimes. One of the things that we have said that uh, uh, we want to make sure is that crime doesn't pay. Those who are involved in it um, will face, you know, potentially not just uh, jail sentences, but the loss of, uh, of, of, of property that has been obtained through uh, ill-gotten gains, through the proceeds of, of crime. The court battle started after Mounties raided the Nanaimo Clubhouse in 2007. The Mounties, the Northwest Mounties. We always get our man. Uh, I, I just remember that from television, like when I was a kid. I don't know if they're the Northwest Mounties or not. Uh, but anyway, this is interesting because what happened was that uh, Combined Forces Special Enforcement Unit came. And uh, in this story... Um, I remember this story, and let me get my face back up here. Hold on, put me back in there. There we are. In this story, I remember them saying this was this was like extremely extremely screwed up because they are they took the clubhouse for it's kind of like the Minority Report. You remember you guys remember the Minority Report where that was the movie with um uh, Tom Cruise, I believe it was where they arrested you and, and even, even put you to death, I think, for crimes you might commit. Remember that? And you were like, when you were watching that, you are like, they, they can't do that for crimes you might commit. But here we are. British Columbia Civil, Asset, uh, Civil Forfeiture Office moved Friday to seize the assets belonging to the Hells Angels after they won in court, including three clubhouses in Nanaimo, Vancouver, and uh, Kelowna, as we as we heard, the anti-gang spokesperson spoke up saying, you know, uh, we're not going to let you make money and all that kind of stuff. He said he's extremely pleased. We don't want crime to pay. Uh, and he wanted to say that this sends a very strong message that crime does not pay. He said, we've known for a long time the Hells Angels is a criminal organization. Doesn't matter if it's a clubhouse or other asset a high-value car or a high-value boat. If it's been obtained through organized crime, they're going to lose it. And I don't know how they determined that, but they did. Their highest court, the highest court in the land of British Columbia, ruled the province could seize the clubhouses because the bikers, now watch this, because the bikers would likely keep using the properties to plan or commit illegal activities. Not for crimes they actually committed, but for crimes they would likely keep committing in the future. That's a mofo, bro. That's a mofo. That's the minority report. It's on us. It's here. We're going to take your money and your land and because, because of what you might continue to do in the future. What if you say, well, we won't do that anymore. We're sorry doesn't matter. You're likely to continue to do that. And the Court of Appeals decision overturned the 2020 ruling in the British Columbia Supreme Court that allowed the biker gang to retain ownership of the properties. So they actually appealed and overturned uh, uh, the Supreme Court ruling? Is this, I guess the Supreme Court must not be the highest court. I don't know. Because how does a court appeal the decision of the Supreme Court? I don't know. But it happened. That allowed them to keep and retain ownership of their properties because the forfeiture office failed to prove, they failed to prove that it would be used to commit crimes. So this was, this, that's, that's crazy. A appeal court said, you can't do that. You can't prove that they're going to commit crimes. How can you prove that? And the 
decision overturned that Supreme Court and said, yes, we can. We can. We can prove what they might do. The unanimous ruling from the three-member appellate court found the lower court's decision was tainted in several ways, including its failure to link the club's I remember reading this story to y'all, uh, including uh, its failure to link the club's penchant for secrecy. <laughs> oh, my God. You can't keep secrets no more. What about the secret Dakota rings that you get from a, a little bitty kid in the Cracker Jacks box? You're always supposed to have a little clubhouse somewhere where only you know the secrets. But now they're putting that against you. The club's penchant for secrecy and preoccupation with rats and snitches. Do you remember that? Remember that story? Pensions for secrecy, preoccupation with rats and snitches with its efforts to hide criminal activity. The panel wrote the clubhouses, provided a safe space for the planning and commission of crimes, and found it inescapable that the clubhouses were likely to be used in the future as they had in the past. So anyway, they took their properties. And the properties were valued at three million dollars. Three million. Yeah. They were valued at three million dollars. So the Hells Angels have filed a counterclaim and successfully challenged the constitutionality of the Forfeiture Act as it relates to the uh, future criminality. And the Supreme Court dismissed the claims of the director in 2020 and ordered the properties returned. So the BC Attorney General and the Director of Civil Forfeiture appealed that decision last year, ending with the BC High Court's reversal of the decision. The three clubhouses located uh, out there, where you guys would probably know where those places are, are valued at more than $3 million, and the province will now examine what is the best use in the public interest of the taken, stolen, and seized $3 million buckaroos back over to our main story so you can see how all these things piece together how the two clubs were associated and how they took the hell's angels properties so they're like you know what that worked real good let's see if we can't get these so again they said the property should be forfeited as proceeds of and an instrument of unlawful activity so they took the $3 million worth of properties when they, they reversed a lower court's decision. The Hells Angels are seeking leave. They're trying to appeal that decision of the Supreme Court. The appeal judges noted the security measures, and, and they're still on that BS. They're still on that balderdash. Still on it. The appeal judges noted the security measures of the Hells Angels had taken at the clubhouses to prevent police from surreptitiously monitoring, monitoring its activities. What the hell's going on in Canada? We got to open up our buttholes so you can look in them? And if we don't allow you to surreptitiously monitor our activities, we lose our clubhouses and $3 million worth of properties? What do you want us to do? Just... Put the cameras in there for you? Hey, guys, do a jig for the camera every hour on the hour. You want us to get on the pole and dance? You can't be serious with this stuff. And they say America's not a good place to live. Well, get out. Get your ass out. Go on on. Go on on. Go on on. Go on on. Go on on over there where they can monitor surreptitiously your activities. And you got to let them. I know, dog. I know it's crazy. <sighs> I, I just, let me go on on and read some more over here because y'all are crazy. The clubhouses provided a safe space for members to, as we said, committing or conspire to commit crime. Uh, that, that was the ruling for the Hells Angels. So in the new suit filed against Alexander, that same director of asset forfeiture said that if the defendant retains ownership, access or possession of the property, 
it will likely be used by the defendant to engage in or facilitate the unlawful activity by allowing the defendant to plan, conspire, to commit and or commit the unlawful activity in secrecy. Well, I guess they ain't got no masons and stuff up there. They don't have no secret organizations. Holy bat jeepers. I mean, cowabunga. How in the hell? Huh. My goodness. Uh, I'm telling you, this is, this is crazy. Anyway, uh, you can't, I guess, cause you can't, you can't have any secrets. Some or all of the funds used to acquire and or maintain the property were proceeds of the unlawful activity, he said. He didn't say which, just some or all. Like, gosh, like you can just be as vague as the hell you want to be to go take somebody's $3 million, excuse me, half million dollar property. Not only has Alexander committed murder, but he is also guilty of membership in a criminal organization. And and, uh, they're making that uh, guilty, even here in the United States. You're guilty of being a member of them dudes. Money laundering and failure to declare taxable income, the lawsuit says. So, I'm wondering, how the hell are you going to do all that in prison for 25 years <laughs> without the possibility of parole for 25 years. You could be in there 40 years. He's 68 years old. Where the hell is he going to go? Well, he's probably like 70 or something now. If he wins that appeal, and, and it seems like there's a lot of fishiness in it, the government is stacking up on that ass, bro. And the thing you can't do is piss the government off. I guess not even the Canadian government. I just thought America was the only government you shouldn't piss off. I wasn't thinking about Russia and stuff. Ask Brittany Griner. She pissed them off. Almost never got out of there. Got that one American Marine over there. It don't seem like they're ever going to let his ass out. And I guess we find out Canada is not a place to play with either. <sighs> and it'd be cold up there. Like I said, cowabunga! This is crazy. They're, they're, they ain't playing. You can't have no security fence, my boy. My guy, my guy, you can't have any anti-surreptitious monitoring sweet packages or anything. My guy, no no surveillance cameras. My guy, no secret decoder rings or handshakes. None of that. Or you won't be allowed to keep your $3 million in properties and assets, boats, cars, motorcycles, rings, watches, or gee dunk, which is a Navy term for wonderful, beautiful candies and, and junk food. They're going to come get your gee dunk too, bro. Everything. Your fat pills. Everything. Whew. Huh. Wow. So... Um, and in all of this, a guy named, young man named Dylan Brown is no longer with us, uh, because the young man didn't understand that, um, these, these guys aren't nothing to mess with. Um, there was some, some things he didn't understand, like going in that damn, that damn clubhouse by himself mistake of a young man now no longer with us so 2016 that young man was killed and it's now 2024 and they ain't done yet your uh, boy Alexander's in there he's got an appeal um, 
All this stuff's being appealed. This would go on another five or ten years. So that's what's going on. That's the story that you guys got today. And, um, you know, think about that. You got, you got to think about some repercussions out here because the repercussions are huge, are huge. And those guys that are supposed to be your friends and your club brothers and your homies, well, when they start waving that time in front of a guy's face, and he'd be like, hold up now. I didn't kill nobody. I just walked in there and there's the dead body. And I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to help you clean it up and everything. Okay, well, I, I'm down until the police come. They don't be your friends. They, they're like rats jumping off a seeking ship. Every rat for himself. You got to think that out, man. You got to think that out when you're in the bar getting ready to fight the guy. Somebody with a clearer mind be like, hey, man, we don't want to lose our $3 million worth of clubs. Quit playing. We don't want to lose our $569,000 clubhouse. Stop playing. Everybody's got a camera. The cameras are always, always on. Everybody's ready. You don't get away with this stuff. You go to prison. They take your money your property, everything they can get. If you ever get out of that prison, you will be a broke and broken person. Is all that worth it? Maybe to a young man that ain't thinking, but once you start getting 60, 70, and 80, and you realize, I'm going to get out of jail, I'm going to have 15 years left in my life, I'm going to be broke as a mofo. (laughs) Starting all over. I'm going to die under a bridge somewhere, cold and wet, thinking about when I was a tough guy and cussing my young dumb ass out from my old self. (sighs) No need to talk this to death. You guys see what's going on here. Use your thinking pieces. Use your thinking pieces. Try to find a way to treat people like individual pieces of solid gold, and you won't have to go through this at all. Does that make sense? I hope so. All right. I'm Black Dragon. That's my two cents. Love to hear your two cents in the comment section below. Uh, listen, I, I told you I bounced up to 345 pounds. Well, I've come back down, and uh, I'm very pleased and proud of myself. I've come back down now to 339 uh, over the, this past week, so that's really cool. When we come back, uh, oh, yeah, we got to talk about these guys here. These are our Australian friends uh, who have a new podcast called No Justice for Bikers in Australia. So now we got some Australian guys talking to us. Yeah. 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 So they're going to be talking to us. Uh, uh, they're, this this um, one is called No Justice for Bikers in Australia. We've been talking about it for a while, but we've been talking about it like from our standpoint. Like we're not there. We're just reading stuff. So we don't know exactly like what's going on there. And these guys are over there sitting across the pond in the land down under telling us about uh, what's going on there. So make sure to go to no justice. By the judicial system? Yeah, and, and that's what we have to call it, is a judicial system, because it's certainly not a justice system. No. Oh, shoot. Ha! Huh. You know, I mean, I watched live the court case via, um, I, I don't know, Zoom or the, the type of, you know, only a certain amount of people allowed in the court, so... Uh, a lot of people watch this by by Zoom, and and to watch the defence counsel explain that you need to take the emotion out of it. They're talking about a brother who was killed on his motorcycle, and uh, the um, this is the way the courts handled it. It was very horrible. So get over there to No Justice for Bikers in Australia. The name of the uh, of the Facebook, uh, of the uh, YouTube page is Hogs, Cogs, C-O-G-S, and two 
Aussie flogs. What the hell any of that means is, is beyond me. Uh, but it is hogs, which must mean motorcycles, cogs, I don't know what a cog is, and two Aussie flogs. I don't know what a flog is. I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to like say the wrong word. Like, oh my God, you, you just insulted us. You called us flogs. Dude, that's, that's the name of it. I, I'm sorry. I'm not from there. I don't want to call y'all the wrong thing, but hogs, cogs, and two Aussie, A-U-S-S-I-E, flogs, F-L-O-G-S. I think a cog is like a part of a wheel or something. Got to look that up. Cogs. Hogs, Cogs, and two Aussie Flogs. So go check them out over there. Uh, they sent me this, this email, uh, text message, whatever it was, email something, and told me they'd be doing this. And we want to throw our full support behind our land down under brothers that are down there covering the biker scene and keeping us all relevant. And we can see the government is messed up everywhere, man. <laughs> everywhere i'm black dragon man i'm gonna let you guys get up out of here thank you so much for tuning in let me find the get up out of here buttons i'll see you guys same bad time same bad channel trying to be back on my schedule which is 10 o'clock uh, a.m uh eastern time monday through friday and there'll be a lot of times i'm putting up two or three videos a day to give you guys your money's worth so let me know in the likes and description descriptions and, and comments how we're doing and uh if you're liking our format and that sort of thing all right thanks guys prepare yourself to take the helm as president of your mighty motorcycle club by delving into the pages of black dragon's newest book the president's bible chronicle one principles of motorcycle club leadership there you will learn to advance your skills in applying the 14 scientific principles of leadership similar to those taught to officers in the United States Naval Service. Available in hardcover, paperback, and ebook, get yours today on Amazon, Kindle, or order it at your local bookstore. Order your autographed copy from blackdragonsgear.com. Be the best motorcycle club president you can be. Get the book. Get Black Dragon's first book, The Prospects Bible, to learn how to join a motorcycle club. It has been an Amazon number one bestseller for the past seven years and is required reading for over 3,000 motorcycle clubs worldwide. This book is a must have for new people venturing onto the motorcycle club set. It will teach you how to prepare yourself for service to the motorcycle club nation and show you how to qualify a motorcycle club to be worthy of your service. Available on Amazon, Kindle, and for order at your local bookstore. Get your autograph copy at blackdragonsgear.com. Be the best motorcycle club prospect you can be. Get the book.